Pentecost is often seen as the birthday of the Christian church. Some see it as the coming down day of the Holy Spirit, but there's something more to this than just those elements. Find out on this episode of Inverse. Hello, everyone. We're so happy that you decided to join us here for our conversation on Inverse. This episode, we are on Acts chapter 2-ish, kind of 2 or 3-ish. And uh, man, I just feel like we need the Holy Spirit right now, the mm -hmm. Pentecost experience now for prayer. So I'm going to ask that. Sebastian, can you open us in prayer? Absolutely. Let's do that. Our Father, what a pleasure, Lord, it is to be here at your feet, clothed and in our right minds. We pray, Lord, that that same spirit of which we are about to speak and discuss, that he would rest upon our minds just now, granting us insight in the Bible, guiding us, Lord, into all truth, just as Jesus promised, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Sebastian. Let's get into the Word of God here. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 32 and uh, 33. And uh, CQ, you mind us reading those two verses? Um, verse 32 in Acts chapter 2. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. And verse 30, oh, that was 33. Yeah, amen. Um, Israel, what's going on here? What's, what's, I think this is um, Peter preaching, yeah? Yeah, Peter's responding to the, the accusation, if you will, from the people. So we have to back up. Jesus in Acts chapter 1, he promises, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. comes upon you. And he says, you're going to be my witnesses. This is the, not only the command, but also the promise that Jesus gives his disciples prior to his ascension. You are going to be my witnesses. So the disciples are praying in the upper room. All of a sudden, during that prayer meeting, the Holy Spirit falls upon them. They get the gift of tongues and Pentecost comes. It arrives. People are watching this and they're saying, these guys have to be drunk. Something's wrong. This is fishy. And so now Peter's responding, and his response is, what you are seeing now is simply the fulfillment of that command and that promise that Jesus gave to us, mm -hmm. that we would be his witnesses. And so we are here being the witnesses that Jesus has called us to mm -hmm. be. And so what, well, let's, let's, let's kind of backtrack a bit. What actually happened at Pentecost? You know, we have Pentecostal churches. We have Pentecost experiences. We've got revivals called Pentecost. Everybody was going through, going through Pentecost. Siku, what, what is, uh, give us a biblical synopsis on what actually happened at Pentecost. So they're up in the upper room and it says when the day of Pentecost came, there was a sound that was heard mm. as if it was a, a, rushing, a rushing mighty wind, mm. right? And then these tongues that were like fire, they appear on top of these people's heads and they're endowed with a gift to be able to speak in different languages mm -hmm. so that as they're going out to share the gospel with people, they can hear the gospel in their mother tongue. And so these disciples receive this gift and they go out and now they're preaching and, and Jerusalem is filled with people from all over, um, all over the, 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 the world, Roman right? Empire. Yeah, the then world. And, and the disciples are now preaching about Jesus in a language that people grew up hearing. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's got, um, it's not just hearing uh, the ideas, but you know, hearing something in your own mother tongue, it does something mm -hmm. you know, inside of you. And so it, it hits a part of them that they didn't understand. So we got Jerusalem here, which is like the modern day Tokyo or London, or maybe Tokyo is more mono monoculture of Japanese, but mm -hmm. uh, London, New York, New York. Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and uh, I, the I don't center, know. just the center, center. a big center. place where <laughs> a there's center. a lot of languages. Yes. And all these yeah. different languages are there. And so this is this is not an angelic language. This is not an intelligible language. This is well, what is it? The Bible Bible says here, verse. Um, help me out here. It says in verse uh, six, right? Verse mm -hmm. six. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone, everyone heard, them speak heard them speak in, in his, his own, own language. language. And that phrase is repeated throughout that passage in their own language. There, there are some understanding going on there. Why does God give this gift of tongues? Right well, I think Sebastian. you know, going back to Siku's point about the Jews were required, you know, based on Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 16 and Exodus 23 that they're going there three times a year God said they have to appear in Jerusalem mm -hmm. every man has to come 
Mm -hmm. So therefore, God strategically set it up so that that 50 days, right, from that Passover when Jesus died, we get the 40 days we took, talked about in the previous episode, and now we're like, okay, you know, 50 days, Pentecost comes, every person who is a Jew in any place, right, Greece, Macedonia, whatever, he's like, I have to go to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Because God says, I have to go to Jerusalem. So they're there to celebrate this Jewish festival, but yet it was perfectly set up for them to receive the gospel. But the problem was, if the Holy Spirit came down upon you and gave you power, right, but people can understand your powerful message mm -hmm. because they're speaking different languages. So at that point in time, God gave this particular gift to support the mission, right, which was the foundation of what we looked at in the first chapter of Acts, which mm -hmm. was all of this, receiving the Holy Spirit and being in one accord was so you could fulfill the mission. I, I love that. The, the foundational layer is mission. Yeah. Yes. And everything added to that is just to support this foundation of mission. Yes. Some people have taken these, these gifts and then they've kind of bifurcated and separated and made them independent of mission and yes. then just for us to experience in themselves. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a disconnect there mm -hmm. on a certain level. Big time. Mm -hmm. um, it, gives us, it gives us a picture here. We get a picture as to why God gives us gifts. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the reason for the gifts is to advance the mission. And what I love about Acts chapter 2 is Acts chapter 1 kind of sets the foundation for us. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is giving the early Christian church is it's a small church. It's made up of a, a little over 100 people. It's a very small church. They're made up of people that, according to the text, they're not educated individuals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they have this awesome responsibility of being the witnesses of Jesus. And he says, unto the ends of the world. You're going to be my witnesses to the entire world. Yep. If you are a part of that group, if I'm a part of that group, I'd be thinking, like, how in the world is this possible? How is God giving me this enormous responsibility that there is no way I can fulfill? Mm -hmm. And so the early Christian church, I imagine them being somewhat nervous and confused of regarding, you know, the, the mission that God is calling them to do. How are we going to be wit God's witnesses all over the world? This is an impossibility. And so what God does in Acts chapter 2 is he removes the element of the impossible. Yeah, it, it might be impossible for you, but it is not the capabilities that you now possess or that you mm. ever will possess that will determine success. Mm -hmm. And so Acts chapter 2 comes, the, world, you know, the, the early Christian church is thinking, how am I going to accomplish God's vision, God's purpose? Boom, you have this supernatural gift to speak in tongues that you never studied, to speak in languages that you never grew up listening or, or, or speaking. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, the mission that God gives to you and that gives to me is... Seems a little bit more possible. Yeah. And so God is removing just... He's like, look, don't worry about what you don't have. Mm -hmm. Worry about what you can receive, which is here, the filling, not just the receiving, but the filling of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. upon the life of the individual. And think about the fact that like you said, right, you're sitting here thinking about the, the difficulty of the mission globally, but even specific to Jerusalem. Like, yeah. you want us to talk about Jesus who just died publicly, shamefully, right? Right. This is not the place you want to start and being like, oh, he's risen and da da da. It's like, that's the crazy. People who killed him. Exactly. It's yeah. like, yeah, we need you to come along. That's where he wants you to start, where it seems to be the most rub. And that, that kind of um, experience. For the disciples, it's like, yeah, you're going to start here. How are we going to even reach these people locally mm -hmm. who know us, who saw us fleeing Jesus when he was being crucified? Which speaks to, I think, when, when God calls us to be witnesses, um, probably the hardest place that it is to be a Christian witness is in your own home. Mm -hmm. with people who see you every single day. They know the ins and outs. They know how to rub you the wrong way. And it can be a really scary mission, I think, sometimes even scarier than going out to the ends of the world. Yeah. But then Jesus calls us to be a witness in our own homes to the people who know us best. Yes. And then he says, I'm going to give you the power to be able to do that, which seems impossible. You see these concentric circles, and mm -hmm. sometimes you wonder if we actually focus on the opposite. We try to do the larger first, and yes. mm -hmm. we neglect that, which is central. Mm -hmm. uh, makes you kind of be more reflective on how the Holy Spirit works in your own life. Yeah. Sebastian? You know, the other thing that is also the word witnesses gets me is because it undermines this whole concept of being completely theologically all put together in order to be active for Christ because it was about witnessing to his resurrection and the things that they had seen and heard. Mm -hmm. So there was a sense of this experimental religion that I have experienced things with Jesus and therefore you're testifying to what you have seen, what you have heard. And so I think this makes the Christian movement more powerful because it's not like, oh, we need to have an eight session meeting 
and trainings with you, that came, um, as we'll look at later in the chapter, that's coming through the fellowship, et cetera, et cetera. But that initial ordaining as a witness just simply came through being able to share. Acts chapter 2, I think, reveals to us what happens when the Spirit of God takes over the life of an individual. Mm -hmm. And I think this, it's, it's, it's great to begin uh, early on the, the story of the church in this way because it gives to us the ideal that God had for His church. His, his ideal, His plan, His mission has always been to be in control. And, you know, even when we think about even the task of being witnesses is not something that he entrusts to people, but he actually empowers them mm. to do. And so, you know, you hear it over and over. God never calls a qualified. He, call, he qualifies a called. This is all a living testimony, evidence of those very things that God is entrusting I mean, you, it to us, something that he's You glossed over it, but maybe, can you say that one more time? Because there's probably people who haven't heard that. That and God, yeah. So God, God never calls a qualified, but he always qualifies a called. And so whenever God, this is evidence, whenever God calls us to do something, in that calling, he's empowering us or he's qualifying us to do the work that he's called us to do. And we don't have to work for God, or when we come, when we work for God, we don't have to come to Him pre-qualified. Mm -hmm. um, he's going to empower us to do what He's asked us to do, and and what we have to be is we have to be willing recipients of like the Holy the opposite Ghost. the way the world works. I mean, yeah. you have to be pre-qualified. You have to have all the credibility prerequisites and the credibility, yeah. and then there's a trust factor. But with yeah. God, the trust factor is before it even happens. It's yeah. a there's a risk there. There's yeah. a risk there. Can we go to, um, let's go to Peter's sermon. And let's look at uh, Peter's sermon there and analyze that a bit. Um, Siku, what's going on in Peter's sermon? What's, what's he saying and what's, what's his point there? Well, he, Peter uses uh, the text in the book of Psalms to build this case for uh, what the people that he was speaking to have done to Jesus. And I find it fascinating because in, in the middle of his sermon, he starts off with, let me explain to you what just happened, what you saw happening was the Holy Spirit was poured out, it was prophesied, and it has happened. Mm -hmm. And then he goes in verse, in verse 22, now he goes to the actors in the events that have just transpired. He said, you crucified Jesus. Mm -hmm. God raised him up. So the actors are, God is doing something and you did something. You crucified Jesus, but God raised him up. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on that even though Jesus died, he was resurrected. And, and as they're hearing this, it causes you to think, okay, this is the role that I've played. Now what role do I want to continue to play? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so that's, I think, in a, in a nutshell, in a nutshell. Like the, the sermon. Yeah, that yeah. Peter and the preaches. beauty, the beauty Especially. about Peter's sermon is that he's quoting a lot of Old Testament scripture, mm -hmm. which obviously there was no New Testament Bible. Mm -hmm. So he's using very central to his message is scriptures that they are familiar with. Right. Yeah. Well, There's, hold that thought, Sebastian. We'll come after the break and we'll see what Old Testament points Paul's trying to make. Hey, welcome back, you guys. Before the break, I mentioned that uh, Paul was preaching here, but Paul wasn't preaching. He doesn't no. come on until later, chapter 9. Mm -hmm. Here we have Peter. And so we uh, got in the spirit of forgiveness. And Thank you for those of you who are watching, you want to make sure that you're biblically <laughs> correct. And you want to quote the Bible verses correctly, like, like Peter does in his sermon. Amen. And, uh, and this pastor you mentioned, he's quoting Old Testament verses from the yes. right people. So yes. uh, what, what were you mentioning? So he, when you think about you know, modern day sermons, it separates a sermon from a talk, from a speech, mm. from a political rhetoric. Like Peter is not just engaging in oratory, right? Mm. Practice, oh yeah, this is a good rhetorical tradition that we can use, because you had the Greeks, you had the Romans at that time. But Peter is dealing with a sermon, which means that the preponderance of that content is coming from the actual Word of God. And Peter's using the Word of God, Old Testament text that they're familiar with, to help shed light on a present day reality mm -hmm. that they're experiencing. I mean, I mean, what you're saying, I almost called you uh, Paul, you're not Paul, you're mm -hmm. Sebastian. Sebastian, what you're saying, <laughs> you're, 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 you are perhaps blasting the majority of sermons preached on, 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 on the weekends. Yes. Because many sermons are just kind of talks or political rhetoric, or they're just saying, hmm, what, what good moral story can I mention today with a couple verses sprinkled in? Yeah, or stir up the crowd and get them really emotionally yeah, you know, built to, up. Yeah, to it's a pep rally, a spiritual pep rally. It's but what you're saying is, or a performance, as, 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 uh, as was mentioned, but you're saying, what if we actually talk about what the Bible is actually talking about? What's mm -hmm. what the Bible says? Yes. Yeah, so and that's Israel. powerful. What, what Peter is doing here is super simple. Mm. Simply, he's taking the Bible, mm -hmm. he's applying it to a modern context, 
and he's making it personal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I, whenever you have that combination, whenever you have the most powerful thing in the world is when you take scripture, you apply it to your current situation, mm -hmm. and you make it personal. Mm -hmm. And typically, one of those three elements is missing. Either you're not preaching the Bible, it's not properly applied to today's context, what's going on right mm -hmm. now in my life right now, mm -hmm. or it's not made personal. We preach the Bible and we apply it to Sebastian, or we apply it to Siku. Hey, this is what the, oh, I can think of someone that really needs this passage, <laughs> right? But, but we never apply it to ourselves. ourselves. Yeah. And this is what Peter is doing. He's getting scripture. He's applying it to right now what's going on, and then he's making a personal application to the individual. Real-time application, simplicity. I mean, this is a beautiful sermon. When I look at it, it's about 26 verses that are, it's, a, it's actually, frankly, a, a short sermon. Mm -hmm. yeah. We don't need a 30, an hour, an hour and a half, some people two hours of preaching every Have mercy. Weekend. And then we he, see here that the about 13 of those 26 verses are Old Testament okay. verses. Yeah. So half the sermon is composed of just reading the Bible. About 11 is composed of explaining the Bible, real-time mm -hmm. application. And then two is applying application. And then the result is? They were cut to the heart. Cut to says. the heart. And then? Yeah, people, what shall we do? Yeah, decision people to give decision, their life. And then? Baptism. And uh, how many baptisms? 3,000. 3,000 baptisms. Yeah, that's a 3,000 right. baptisms. So the more we do this, we're going to see 3,000 baptisms uh, every, happen every day. Uh, Amen. Yeah? And, okay. No, <laughs> no, you don't. You don't. Okay, we have a, not a believer here, Sebastian. No, I, I, totally, I, I, totally a believer, but please, ladies okay, first. No, I mean, I, I was just going to say, people don't always respond to cut to the heart by wanting to be baptized. That is that's right. what That I'm is true. That's true. So, we'll see that a little bit later <laughs> yeah, on, yeah. what happens, heart. because yeah. They, yeah. they'll cut some other people. So, how do you respond to cut to the heart? In the process. Okay. So calm down, yeah. calm down, yeah. down. Take there, a deep breath, Sebastian. Yeah. Calm, calm down, <laughs> Israel. Uh, what's, what's important for us to notice, I think, about Acts chapter 2 is that Peter is not, uh, you know, we give Peter a lot of credit for like, oh, that was a powerful sermon. Mm -hmm. I mean, the guy's just reading the Bible. Right. You know, and I think by many standards today, I don't know about then, it's probably, that's traditionally how it was done, but by many standards today, this is a very just common, average message. Mm -hmm. He's reading the Bible, a few comments. And so what's important for us to notice is the power is not coming from Peter's sermon. Mm -hmm. The power is coming from the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But the Holy Spirit is available whenever the Word of God is preached, mm -hmm. whenever it's applied personally. That's when the Holy Spirit shows and up. And also recognizing the vessel's preparation, right? Yeah. Peter was in the upper room. Yeah, People critically important. Peter received something without the crowd True. that yeah. transformed what yeah. he did in the crowd. Right. right. Okay. I think we spent some time on... Oh, oh I, I just want to talk about the, that preparation in verse 23. 23. Um, I think for me, it's talking about the personal application. Yes. Talking about Jesus, him being delivered, delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands you have crucified him and you have put him to death and then God raised him That's up. Pretty that straight is straightforward. Yes, it's a very, very bold thing to say. And these are the people who ran away and hid after Jesus was crucified. These are Peter the people was, who were yeah. cowering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so for them to come for him to come out and speak so directly to the people who crucified his savior, mm -hmm. they the preparation of the vessel, mm -hmm. you know that Peter's not looking out for his own life right True. now. He's not thinking, how am I going to be saved? Like, you know, um, um, somehow he has receded into the background and the message is way more important than his own personal safety. And he's mm -hmm. been transformed, right? He wouldn't stand before in the same place with the same people and now he's standing, which goes to show what the Holy Spirit does in the individual's life. That mm -hmm. transformation. And just as a caveat though here, here Paul, or I keep saying Peter. Paul, Peter is not trying to get something off his chest. He's mm -hmm. not blaming them mm. and, accu and it, mm. there is Good an ac ac accusation because that's very sharp who is pointing mm. to. Yeah. But the objective is that, hey, if you repent, we will receive the Holy Spirit by the merits of, of Jesus' death. Mm -hmm. So let's get to that point. But, but they need to acknowledge what they did. So that's, they need to, they there's, need a, there's to a love own. here on a sharp tone, but, but love is, is the, mm. the, the right. carrying motif. Yeah. Right. Before, before they can then benefit from what Christ did on the cross, they need to own it. Mm -hmm. right? I need to own that I'm the one who put Jesus on the cross before I can be benefiting from what Jesus did for me on the cross. Correct. And, and so there's he a has to... personalization of the cross. Yes, he yes. has to bring that message home. And, and in our Christian experience, yeah, Jesus died on the cross so everybody could be saved, but until I recognize that it's my sins that put him on the cross, yeah. it's what I did that caused him to give up his life, I'm not going to benefit from what he gave his life for. 
Yeah. Something, I, well, I have to go back to Acts chapter 1. I wish I was part of that episode, but. <laughs> nah, bruh. <laughs> you know, but it's, what Sebastian said, I think, was super profound, and I think it's easy for us to gloss over that, and that is the personal preparation that Peter had. Mm -hmm. That is why Jesus said, wait, you know? Jesus said, wait, don't, you have this mission to go to all the world, but tarry in Jerusalem. Hold on for a second. Before you can go and preach and baptize thousands of people, you have to wait you have to allow for the Holy Spirit to work on you personally. Mm -hmm. That way, when you are called into action, whether it's in season or out of season, you're a fit vessel. You're ready to be used by God to do something so profound. Yeah. And, and so the witnessing, the, the maturity of becoming a witness, the ripening uh, time was spent in prayer, in confessing in of room, sins, yeah. in, you know, in the upper room experience. Yeah. We spent some time on the mechanics of, of Peter mm -hmm. and the message. Let's actually get into the content of yes. what he's saying. So he's giving an Old Testament Bible study, if you mm -hmm. will. Uh, but what, what is he trying to convey? He, I mean, as Siku said, he's like, you're the ones that killed Jesus. Mm -hmm. But what's the reality of Pentecost? Well, Sometimes I think, we think of it as what day when the Holy Spirit comes down. But what's going on? Sebastian? So when you go down to verse 34, right, after our memory, our memory text, it says, for David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Mm -hmm. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Mm -hmm. So they understand that that text is talking about the Messiah in a heavenly ministry, right? Sitting on the right hand of God, which is sanctuary language for a Jew who understood that, hey, when we have that priestly rotation, like Zacharias, John the Baptist's dad, goes in and he sees Gabriel sitting on the right hand of the altar, right? This, this position of favor, this position of acceptance, that they're recognizing that the priest is there on our behalf. But now Peter is saying, guess what? This event that you're witnessing on earth is a mirror and a direct connection to something that's transpired in heavenly realities. Mm -hmm. And this, he's bringing together this context to say, scripture heavenly realities and earthly happenings are all inter intertwined in this. Mm -hmm. That the Bible foretold it, now you're witnessing it, and this is a result of what's happening above. So we, we often look at Pentecost as the day of when the Holy Spirit came down, when the church was born. Yes. But what you're saying here, and what you're saying, and Peter is saying, and what Peter is saying, what the Old Testament, what everyone's saying about it, da, 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 yes. is that there's a heavenly reality, like Jesus has entered into heaven, mm -hmm. Jesus has entered into the heavenly sanctuary, and when that happens, there are ramifications here on earth. Absolutely. Yeah. It is tied together. Yeah, so okay. what's happening here in, at this moment, What's happening, or when the text in, in this moment in the text, yes, what is happening is that Jesus has now ascended and has been granted kingly authority by God the Father. Now, mm -hmm. Jesus has the authority as the king of the universe, mm -hmm. and his first act as the king of the world is boom, I'm going to give you my spirit. Remember, I promised you that when I left, I would send the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Well, now that I'm the king of the world, now that I'm the king of the universe. I am, you can take that check to the bank and here's the Spirit of God and it's going to fall upon you in this way. Mm -hmm. And Peter's explaining to them, look, like what Sebastian already said so eloquently, the heavenly realities impact earthly realities. And we should take courage in that. Mm -hmm. We should take courage in the fact that heaven is interested in what's going on right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. and, and, and even crazier still, that heaven is responding to or that heaven lives mm -hmm based on our reality. You know, that heaven is so in, invested in our reality that it modifies what is going on. Not modifies, but that it, it I can't even think of the it language. It kind of invades, in that, sense. Yeah, that it, 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 it responds to what is taking place here on earth. You know, heaven is very interested in us. And so God sees we need the Spirit, and He gives us the Spirit at a point in, in time. Like the, in the principles that I'm picking up here is, is Bible study, it's simplicity, it's Christ-centeredness, mm -hmm. heavenly sanctuary, Holy Spirit-centeredness. How, how do we, let's make it real, real practical, like how do, we, how do we get that? How do we do this? I, I want this experience, and how do we get that? We'll go to Siku first, then we'll go to Sebastian. Um, one of the things that, that strikes me in the listeners to the message, and I think it's similar to what happened with the disciples after Jesus went to heaven, when they hear the message, in verse 37, it says, they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Mm -hmm. And their response, they said, what shall we do? Yeah. There's, a certain, there's an element of surrender, right? And they recognize that we need to respond to this. What, what kind of response is required of us? And a willingness to do whatever it takes to, 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 to connect with 
this reality that they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. And I think for us, like being willing to say, you know what, there, there are these realities that are, that are ongoing. I'm willing to surrender my life so that I can be connected with the realities of Jesus being in heaven. Yeah. What does that mean for my life? Lord, you're, heaven is willing to alter its reality. Its reality is shaped around the fact that we are, you know, in a spiritual struggle. And what shall I do? How am I right. going to live my life in, in the light of what is going on? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Surrender. I think it, it speaks to one basic concept. Uh, for me is that Peter was not just quoting any scripture. Mm -hmm. he, was quote, he was quoting scriptures that were relevant to the immediate experience of his listeners. So when we think about preaching a sermon, right, that is bi biblically based, that is Christ-centered, and that is reflective of heavenly realities, which you now see in here, Peter says, your, your, your censors, your senses, sorry, censors, <laughs> your senses are picking up on something that heaven is doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it started with studying those parts of the Bible that are relevant to your actual present day experience. It doesn't make sense for me to be like, well, I'm married and I have kids, but I'm looking through Jeremiah, you know, and I'm going through the weeping prophet. Not that the Bible is irrelevant at any point in time, but I find that there's a prophetic relevance that Peter brought that's very different than just a general teaching mm -hmm. on some theological point. Yeah, that made it very specific and very powerful that the Holy Spirit could use that. And take you know, it many heart. philosophers surmise that uh, should we find life on other planets, uh, it would change the course of human history. It, it changes the narrative of humanity that we are not here by ourselves. And what the message of Pentecost is really saying is there is a heavenly reality that Christ who came into our human reality has now ascended to heaven and all of heaven is invested in human history. Amen. It changes who we are as human beings and that is one at the core of the church's message. Hopefully it's changed your reality, it's, changed, it's changing ours as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week here in Inverse.